Welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at another famous position in the rook and pawn endgame. This one is called the Vancura position, and it's black to move and draw the game. Now let me know your answers in the comments if you're already familiar with the technique. I'd love to hear how you apply it in your games. For the rest of you, let's take a look at the board. So how will we, playing black, stop this pawn right here from promoting? Now, if your initial thought is to bring your king all the way out here and to help, well, unfortunately, that's going to lose us the game. In the Mancura position, we don't use the king for defending at all. We only use the rook. Now, the king is perfectly placed right there on the g7 square, and you're going to see why in a minute. So, if you play king to f7, white is going to bring in his king to help as well. Moves their king to e4, we move our king to e7. They move their pawn a little bit closer with a7, and then if we move our king to d7, white is simply going to move his rook over to one of these squares and promote next turn. If black were to capture the pawn, white has a skewer with the rook to g7, winning the rook. See why it's important to keep that king on the g7 square? It's exactly for this reason, to cut the rook's squares away. Now white's main idea here is to bring his king near his pawn, either on b6 or b7 and clear the way for promoting by moving the rook away. Black's main purpose is to stop that. And how do you stop it? By simply checking the enemy king and not allowing him near those squares. So, how do you apply those checks? Well, if you said moving your rook to a3, check. Unfortunately, that's also the wrong answer. White is just going to move to e4. Black moves the rook to a4. White king to d5. Rook to a5. White to c6. And now, we don't have any checks available. If we bring our rook back to a1, trying to check on the b-file, this is already going to be too late. Because after white moves king to b7, white's going to have this little refuge here over on a7. Black rook to b1, check, king to a7. And white is going to manage to move his rook and will promote. Black rook to e1, rook to d8. And how do you stop that? Black rook to e6, white rook to b6. Now, you can't go rook to e7, check, because white is just going to respond with rook to b7, and he's going to force a rook trade. Even if you try to move your rook to the g file, it's still going to end in a draw. White rook to a7, check. We move our king to f6, and then the white moves rook to h7, and then white is just going to push the pawn. Black rook to a3, white to a7, and if black would attack the rook, white is simply going to move the rook over on the 7th rank and wait for his king's support to promote. So, what is the pattern here? Well, we start by giving a check on f1. White moves king to e4, and after that, we move our rook to the 6th rank. As a golden rule, we stay here until the pawn pushes to a7, to which we bring our rook to a6. And it's a draw no matter what. This seems kind of similar to the Philidor position. Basically, in this position, white has two options. Push the pawn, or bring in his king to help the promotion. If he decides to push the pawn, remember our rule. Bring the rook on the a-file, but you might ask, why is this a draw now? Well, it's because the king is no longer going to have this little refuge on a7, and he won't be able to escape our checks. So, white moves king to d5, and we slide our rook to a1. White king to c6, and then we just start to check. Rook to c1, check. If white were to go to the d file, we'd shift back to defense with rook to a1. If instead, white tries to come after our rook with king to b5, we play b1, check. White moves king to c4, rook back to a1. White moves king to b3. We move the rook up, and we see how white has no way of winning this. He can't get his rook out of there because it would just lose his pawn. And he can't force our rook out of the a-file. But our opponent knows that if he moves the pawn, it's going to be a draw. So he's going to play king to d5 instead. Now we're going to introduce our second golden rule. If the enemy king is on a supporting square we got to start checking him right away. But what do I mean by supporting square? It's these squares right here near the pawn, where the king can support it and help it promote. I don't know if there's an actual term for it, I just like to call them supporting squares. It's easy to remember. So, these supporting squares here are b5, b6, and b7. Now why is it a lost game if the king reaches one of those squares without being checked? Well, it's because the king is then going to overtake the rook's duty of guarding that pawn, and then the rook can freely move and rejoin the game. Until the enemy king is not on one of those squares, Black's rook is just going to patiently wait on the 6th rank. Now, let's see it in action. Is the king on one of the supporting squares? No. So we're going to shuffle our rook to g6. 
White king to c5. Again, not yet on one of the squares near the pawn. So we shuffle the rook once again to e6. King moves to b5. Now the white king has arrived on one of those squares. And let's see what happens if we decide to delay the checks by only one turn. I mean, the king is cut off, right? He can't go to the sixth rank. This is impossible to defend, right? If you play rook to f6 here, white can bring his rook to c8. And if you say, oh no, I should start checking and play rook to f5, now white is not forced to move his king, and instead he can block the check with his rook, with rook to c5. Now how do you stop that pawn now? Rook to f8, rook moves to c6. Rook to f2, trying to attack it from behind, white just doesn't care. He pushes to a7 because if you play rook to a2, white is going to defend with king to b6. Rook to b2, king to c7. See how this transformed into a Lucena position? If you didn't see my video about the Philidor and Lucena positions, definitely check those out as well. I think I'll link it in the description. As I told you in that video, every rook and pawn endgame is either a variation of the Philidor or the Lucena. As we saw, when we brought our rook to the sixth file and tried to draw the game, that was a Philidor variation. Now, with white trying to promote his pawn, this is a Lucena position. With white, building a bridge to secure the pawn promotion. So, black moves rook to a2, white defends once again with king to b7, and now black's check on b2 is met with white rook to b6, and it's good game for black. See how important it is not to waste any moves, and not give white the chance to bring his rook back into the game? That's a major threat. Once the king reaches one of those squares, we start checking immediately. Black rook to e5, king to b6, rook to e6. King to b7, we check him again. King to b8, you guessed it, rook to e8, check. And white is forced to leave the b-file sooner or later. Again, king to b5, rook to e5. King to b4, we can keep checking or placing the rook back on the 6th rank. And we see how white has no way of converting this now. Now what if he would start coming after our rook? Let's say after king to b4, Black moves rook to e4 check, and now white moves king to c5. Black rook to e6, king to d5. Now we're just going to move the rook along the file. Let's recap our two rules. First, keep your rook on the 6th rank until the enemy king reaches one of the supporting squares. And second, when the king reaches one of those squares, you start checking it immediately until you kick him out of there. Now it's important to remember those rules, because white has a little trick here to make you lose the game, by playing king to d4. Remember. If the king is not on one of those squares, b5, b6, b7, keep the rook on the rank, because if you think, hey, maybe I could give a check here and play rook to f4, white has this unbelievable resource with king to e5. Even if at first glance it doesn't look so scary, you just retreat your rook over here to f6, defending it and also placing it again on the same file, it would turn out really scary after the rook sack on g8. Now, black needs to take it. But white would capture the rook as well and promote next turn. After the rook sack, black has no way to defend. King to f7, rook to f8. And now you're forced to take and black would lose the game. Now this is why it's so important to always follow the rules and know your endgame patterns. As I always say, and I'm going to be repeating myself here, even in the most basic chess endgame scenarios, there's always a notable level of complexity because there's almost always more depth to what looks like simplicity here. Take care and keep studying those endgames.